Welcome to Resurrection Church. We're so glad to have you here today. We're excited to worship with you. Now every 
is now satisfied hearing your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing.
heaven held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God Welcome, Resurrection Church. Uh, today, we're going to take a Sunday, and we're going to look at something a little bit different in between our series. I've had an opportunity over the course of the last few months in my personal life to have, an, have a chance to just share the, the gospel and my faith with a lot of people from my personal life that are, uh, well, the gospel is very foreign to them. They don't have a background in church. They don't have really a background in understanding the Judeo-Christian faith at all. Uh, many have never heard of the gospel. And so, 
in that time frame, I've had this opportunity to learn what it's like to really back up and start with questions that all of humanity struggles with in order to find an avenue to explain adequately what the gospel is and, and why it's important and, and, and to change or correct misconceptions around the gospel. And one of the things that I've landed on when I'm talking to people that just have no frame of reference for faith is really to talk about what is the purpose of life? What is the the reason we're here? Why? What is the goal for your life? Or why are you here? Or why is humanity here? And really looking at some of what are almost like these existential questions of, of let's look at our existence. Why does it matter? What are you here for? And we all have different views on that. Most of us are so busy in our personal lives, we rarely have time to think about those things. And people would be like, oh, that's kind of deep. You know, I haven't thought about that. But, but I think it, it is of utmost importance, if you're going to live life, you're going to live 50, 60, 70, 80 years on this world, we hope, that you know why you're here. Why, why, why are we doing anything? Why are we doing the things we're doing other than mere survival? And so I think that though people will express this in different ways and they'll use different language, that ultimate, ultimately what it comes down to is that you and I, when we look at what, you know, what is the goal in life, it, most people in the faith, out of the faith, with a faith background would say this, uh, I'm here, you know, my ultimate goal is to be happy. Or they might put it a different way, to be content or to be at peace or to be satisfied. But, but what we're all circling around is that there's this idea of human longing and dissatisfaction and discontentment. And we're all driving toward wanting to sit in a place of contentment or peace. And most of us, as you talk to people, your neighbors, your coworkers, people that, that are far from the Lord, most of us have known some sort of temporary contentment or temporary peace. In fact, if we were to really look at a lot of the reasons that there are different addictions uh, in substance abuse, it's that for a time I, I sort of was able to cover up this discontentment. I was, I was able to cover up this dissatisfaction, but then it would come back again, and so then I would use again or use to a greater extent again. And really what we're circling around is the human condition, and the human condition is this. We all have a need for relationship with God. The Bible is very clear about this. And because there is no path to God without the gospel, instead what we've done is we commonly look to other things, distorted paths, distorted uh, mechanisms to fill that longing, and it often takes us off into just absolutely broken things. This earth is broken, relationship without God is broken, and therefore as we each individually, whether you're, you're, you have a faith background or you don't, whether you're in the United States or in any other country, whether you're in this century or past centuries, we all end up with the same common attempts at satisfaction and contentment. It, 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 from the beginning of time, as we go back in historical documents, whether the Bible or other, we all end up trying the same things. There are four, I'll submit to you, there are four common distortions, common roads that we have all tried, at least one of these, if not all four of these. And every one of us, whether we are uh, believers in Jesus Christ or we know nothing of any sort of faith, we've all succumbed or tempted one of these four or more than one of these four. And they're this. Number one, uh, what will fix what's inside of me, what will fix this longing is a better version of myself. So the ultimate self-help, and, and this manifests itself in different ways. Uh, if I were just more attractive, if I were just in better shape, if I were just healthier, if I uh, were just smarter or more educated, if I just had, and, and it's all about a better version of myself in some way or some fashion is going to solve this longing, this discontentment, this problem inside of me. And so I'm just going to continue down this path in a multi-billion dollar industry, the self-help industry, uh, whether from uh, counseling or therapy or groups or books or exercise, and none of those things themselves are bad, but what, when, what is powering those things is that I can reach contentment if I can just get a better version of myself. Ultimately, it will leave every single one of us longing, even after all of those self-help steps. That's number one. We, you may have tried this. You may be trying this now. I certainly have come down this path as well. The second uh, one is a better version of myself, but the second is others, sort of affirmation from others, the way that I'm seen uh, in, in, in relationships. And so common ways that we see that, uh, what other people think of me. So the words of affirmation, the praise that other would, others would give me, uh, really when others see me a certain way, then that will lead to this contentment. Or maybe an individual, maybe it's a romantic relationship. If I could just find the right partner, the right spouse, the right girlfriend, boyfriend, if I could just get the right relationship, 
then I would be content. And, and we've all seen it or we've experienced it ourselves where uh, it's not working because we put, we're basically asking for that person to become God for us, not in those words, we'd never say that, but the expectation of that contentment that only God can give has now been laid on the shoulders of a person. And so we've all had the person that just goes from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship and always thinks the other person is the problem. And what we're really saying is you're seeking this contentment, this peace, this satisfaction in a place that was never intended and therefore it just keeps being broken again and again. We've seen that. So a better version of myself where I'm elevating myself to God. I'm just trying to improve myself to the point that I can take God's place that's missing in my life. That doesn't work. And others, whether it's spouse or friends or the general public or even kids, we, we, idol, you know, we, we idolize our kids at times and think that's where contentment will be. If I could just have a baby, if I could just have kids, if I could just have a son, if I could just so on and so forth. It's broken. It doesn't work when we try to make other people our gods. And the third is the, the things of this world. So we value creation, the things that were created over the actual creator. So instead of God satisfying us and filling this longing that is the human desire, instead we fill that with pleasure or possessions. If I could just get enough money or the right job, if I could just experience enough pleasure in lots of different ways, whether that's in food, in sex, in alcohol, in rest, in travel, it doesn't matter. I take the things of this world and I make them God. And I would submit to you that you and I intuitively, if you've not suffered through this in your own life and then, and then later found God and had an understanding of how broken this was, you and I intuitively know this is broken because we look at the, the most famous, the wealthiest people. They, they look very attractive. They're in great shape. Everyone idolizes them. Everyone thinks something of them. They're wealthy. They have everything to do. They have the highest suicide rate in the world. They have the highest depression rate in the world. It is not the impoverished or the poor or the broken that have the highest suicide rate and have the highest depression rate. It is the ultra wealthy, famous person who has tried one of these three paths that we mentioned already or all of them and gotten to what is the pinnacle of human desire, thinking that would be contentment only to find out that it's still broken. It hasn't filled the longing. It's not working. This wasn't the path. And many of us today are still on one of these paths. And the fourth is this, it's religion. Now, I'm going to use religion, the word as a term. I'm going to very narrowly define this so that you understand what I'm saying. When I say religion, what I mean is a a set of performance-based expectations. The idea that there's some sort of cosmic scale in the world uh, with some sort of deity or deities that are supernatural in nature. Whether you call this karma or you call this religion or, or you call this Christianity, which is not real Christianity. Uh, the idea that, that if I just do A, B, C, and D, some sort of cosmic formula, if I, if I can just weigh the scales out, if I can just do more good than bad, I'll somehow earn enough favor from God to fill this longing. And so I use religion, I'm using religion in a negative term here to define a formula by which I can figure God out. God will owe me if I can just do A, B, C, and D, and then I'll feel justified and good and content. Religion. You, you see the gospel, what is defined in the Bible is not religion in that form at all. In fact, uh, behavior-based religion, behavior performance-based religion has never worked. It will never work. It does not lead you satisfied. It leaves you down, leads you down a very dangerous path. Now, not all uses of the word religion are bad. In the book of James, we see religion used in a, in a good term or a good, good context, but I'm going to use it only in a negative context today. And I'm going to define religion as this idea of performance-based behavior versus a relationship, which is what is described in the gospel. Now, to a person who does not know Jesus Christ, I would submit to you that we all, you and I, have in common that we have each attempted or are attempting one or more of these four crooked paths. Assuming that the end of one of those paths is some sort of contentment and satisfaction, when in reality what happens is it will always lead to death. It is always ultimately broken. And while we might have periods of time where we cover up the discontentment and the dissatisfaction because things are going well temporarily, they always end up in the same place. And I want to talk about those in, in, in the context of this is really the human condition that we're all trying to fix, except only a relationship with the Creator fixes it. Now, what 
I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about one of those four crooked paths, and that is religion. And I want to talk about religion because if there's one thing that I personally struggle with as an individual, uh, both just personally and in faith and in corporate faith, it is religious people. I have a tough time loving religious people. I have a very difficult time loving religious people. And, and the reason I have such a struggle with it is, one, probably because uh, I tend to be religious whenever I'm not careful. I have a temptation to do that. But, but secondly, because I was raised in it. I was steeped in it. As Bain would say, I was, I was born and raised in the dark, and you've only recently been here. I, I was born and raised in religion, and so uh, I, I detest it. It's a challenge for me. I grew up as a pastor's kid. By the time I was eight years old, my dad was taking his first church, and we were a very small church, a very fundamentalist church. And so I grew up around religious people. From age four, I lived on campus on a seminary with my family. And so there were certainly many people there that, that loved Jesus and loved the Lord, but there are also a lot of religious people there. And one of my earliest memories when I was five or six years old is my mom and dad coming and telling me that we could no longer watch the Smurfs on Saturday morning as kids. And I didn't understand why. It was just another cartoon like all the other cartoons. But a neighbor had convinced my parents that Gargamel was a sorcerer in the cartoon. Therefore, it was somehow demonic and satanic, and, 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 and it would be sinful to let your kids watch that. And so this sort of behavior-based idea where there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of yeses and nos and they're all predefined and, and your adherence to those rules somehow justifies you along the line. And, and as a kid, I just didn't understand that. And that began this journey for me of many, many, many years of encountering religious people who were very consumed with the appearance of, of righteousness but had no love for the Lord. And it soured me to everything biblical and Christian in my life. Because what I could see in their lives was the crooked path of religion. And at the end of that was just a bitter person who had a lot of rules and no contentment or satisfaction. And I wanted nothing to do with that. Some of you have experienced that yourself. And it was not until experiences in college in which people who loved Jesus, loved the Lord, and loved me, met me with the gospel. And the gospel and Christ pulled me back to relationship with the Lord. Now, Jesus hated religious behavior. He hated religious, moralistic, legalistic behavior with all of his heart. Uh, when people were religious without a, the right heart and intention behind it, it made him nauseous. In fact, uh, nothing made Jesus more angry than inauthentic, moralistic, legalistic behavior that was levied on someone else. Well, someone else had to carry the burden of your legalistic behavior. In Matthew 23, Verse 27, Jesus is talking to very religious people. He's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees. These were, these were high up religious people. They were people that were almost uh, notorious for their religion and their adherence to moralistic behavior, but they're also very legalistic. And he says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. He hated it. Christ hated it. And I hated it too. It drove me from church. It drove me away from God. It frequently becomes the impediment to people actually meeting and finding Christ. Instead of the pathway to Christ, it becomes the speed bump or the obstacle to actually get to faith in Christ. And many of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, many of us, we came to faith, we experienced a, a real, powerful, life-changing Savior, but our, our time, our desperation for the Savior has waned over time, and what's been substituted in for that, that dynamic, Spirit-filled experience that we had meeting Jesus is instead now some sort of like comp uh, uh, constant temptation to just substitute in religion, some sort of tradition, role-based, moral-based, legalistic, I'll check these boxes and everything will be good, and it becomes dry and empty, and as Jesus would say, filled with dead people's bones. There's nothing alive about it. And so what I want to do today is I want to open the Bible with you, and I want to look at a story that I love to look at. I've looked at this over and over again. I'll probably preach this again and again to the day I die. And it is the story of what happens in the church of Ephesus because in the church of Ephesus, we see both this coming to faith in this dynamic way, so dynamic, most of us have probably never seen revival to the extent that it's happening in Ephesus. And then we see fast forwarded well later, we see a problem in Ephesus where they've 
They've lost that dynamic relationship. They've replaced it with legalism. And Jesus, in Revelation, says you need to go back to it. And I want to I work on that with you today. I want to wrestle with you uh, with the text here and just talk about what it means for us. So join me, if you will. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and we're going to look at uh, what Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus now, well past the time that the church is at. We, we know more about the church in Ephesus than we know about any New Testament church. And, and the reason we know so much about the church in Ephesus is that so many books in the Bible reference it. Not just Ephesians, but also in Acts, we see all sorts of things about the church in Ephesus, about its formation. Uh, we see letters to uh, Timothy, who goes and pastors that church, and then we see it here in Acts. So we have a lot of references to the church. And so if a church can go from a dynamic, authentic relationship in Jesus to something else and then be told to go back, I think that has implications for you and I personally, and I think it has implications for us corporately as a church. So look at this. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. All right, we're three verses in to this uh, the, the revelation addressing the church in Ephesus. And all he's done thus far is compliment them. I mean, this, to, let me be really honest, if you're a believer, you understand this, this sounds really good. If I told you, man, this church, Jesus Christ is writing this church, that Jesus thinks that this church has great morality and righteousness, it has really good effort, they work hard at this, both in serving and in being moral and righteous, they're hard workers. They have good effort. They have good morals. They have patient endurance. That they've stayed in the, in the you know for the long race, the long haul. They just keep trying and keep working. And and they've got good doctrine, and they've got good discernment. They're able to smell out bad doctrine. They're able to find false teachers and reject them. I mean, so far when you've heard this, you're going, "That's a church I want to be at." That sounds like a great church. It's got a lot of things going for it. And then verse four, the but, but. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent, unless you repent. Now, uh, everything sounded good till verse 4, but all of a sudden... In this letter to the church in Ephesus, which has had mighty works and done great things and seen revival, and we have a record of all of these things, Jesus tells the church, number one, you've lost your first love. You've lost a love for me in the process of this. So you have all these other things. You have all these things that at different times religion would tell you you have to have. In fact, even Judeo-Christian religion would tell you you have to have. You have to have good morals. You have to have good effort. You have to work hard. You have to have endurance for the long haul, patient endurance. You have to have good theology and doctrine. You have to be able to discern good teachers from bad teachers. All those things sound wonderful, and yet there's an indictment in the church where Jesus says, but because you've lost love for me in this process, repent. Not repent you who don't know Jesus Christ, repent those who are believers but have lost a love for Jesus and are not doing the things necessary to love Jesus even though they're doing these things. Well, what are those things? What, what is it that the church is not doing? What, what, if the church is doing all these things, good morals and righteousness and good effort, hard work, patient endurance, doctrine, good discernment, what are, the th what, is, what, what are the things that are missing? I would submit to you, believer, I would submit to you that in understanding what's missing from the church of Ephesus here in Revelation chapter 2, why there's this indictment and call to repentance, you and I can learn what it looks like to walk passionately, chase passionately after a relationship with Jesus Christ every day for the rest of our lives. Not just start well like they did in Ephesus, but continue well. So what I want to do is I want to go all the way back to the formation of the church 
in the city of Ephesus, which happens in Acts 18 and 19. And I want to look at what they did originally that they're not doing here. What is this indictment about and what does it have to do with you and I? So we're going to go all the way back, if you will, with me to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Paul has now been in Ephesus for some time. He's preaching. We're going to pick this up in verse 8. He's left Corinth. He's left Antioch. He's now speaking in Ephesus in verse 8. It says this, And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, that is the gospel, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So first and foremost, he's preaching the gospel. He starts in the synagogue. He's preaching to Jews who are religious. Some are converted. They understand that the the Messiah has come, but many have pushed back on the gospel. They want to stay in workspace, performance-based religion. He leaves. He takes the disciples. He actually ends up renting a hall where they would do debates and plays and speaking and logic and things like that. And for two years, he preaches the gospel. says, all of Asia, here's the gospel. Uh, that's, that's quite a testament. That for, you, could, you can preach in a little lecture hall for two years and all of Asia will have heard the gospel. So we see the gospel spreading. Now, we're going to take a, a quick, weird turn in Acts. This is the way the Bible works sometimes. And we're going to get one of the stranger stories you're going to hear. You ready? Verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So we've taken a turn, haven't we? Then some of the... Itinerant, and then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now, I don't know if you've ever met an itinerant Jewish exorcist. I've never met one. That would be a traveling exorcist who was not Christian. He was just Jewish or Hebrew. Uh, more than likely, just to describe what this is for you, this is not someone who's actually been exercising demons. They had no power to do so. More than likely, these were con men who would get money by telling you that they would do some sort of religious rites, some sort of satanic or weird rites over you, some sort of sorcery over you, and that supposedly you would be healed and it wasn't working. But all of a sudden, it is working. Not for them, but for Paul all over Asia. And so they hear about it and they go, "Mm, I want some of that. I can make a lot more money if this actually worked. Itinerant Jewish exorcists. Let's pick this up. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I assure you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, that's quite a phrase, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, okay, look, I don't know if you, you know, how much you, you, you really believe, the Bible talks a lot about uh, a battle against flesh and blood versus demons, that there's a spiritual battle, that the demons are real, that Satan is real, the angels are real. Like we don't, we gloss over that a lot, but it's in the Bible. Spiritual warfare is real. It absolutely occurs, but I've never had a demon speak back to me. That alone would be enough for me to be like, I think I'm out of here. Uh, I appreciate you. I love you, but I'm gone. Seven itinerant Jewish exorcists attempt to cast out a demon from a demon-possessed man by saying, we compel you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom Paul believes in, because we don't, catch that, to come out of this man. And the demon answers them. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognized. But who are you? Man, that would send shivers down my spine. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Okay, uh, Matt Chandler's told this joke before. It's, it's, you got seven guys trying to cast out a demon. All of a sudden, the demon answers them. That's scary enough. Then beats them all. Okay. If you, have anyone ever watched UFC or UFC fights? 
Okay, if you're ever watching UFC, maybe, maybe boxing's a, another example, uh, and there's a split decision, or, or the fight comes to a decision. So, like, you know, in UFC, they go five rounds in a championship fight. Uh, there's no TKO, so no one gets knocked out, no one submits. And then the judges, they've got to put in a scorecard and figure out who won. Sometimes you disagree, right? We're not really sure who won. It was a good fight. I'm going to submit to you that if you started the fight with pants on, and by the end of the fight, you had been beaten naked, you probably lost the fight. So you and your six brothers are around one guy. He beats you all wounded and naked and you run away for your lives. You lost. Okay. Verse 17, I want you to catch this. This is the crux of the, of the whole concept right here. And this became known to all the residents in Ephesus both Jews and Greeks. What, what became known? Well, number one, uh, that there were Jewish exorcists misusing God's name for their own gain. That's number one. Number two, that spiritual warfare was so real that a demon attacked men who would misuse God's name, beat them naked, and they ran away. Now, if you're one of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, it's time to get a new job, right? Not only has this become dangerous when before it was actually just a way to make money, uh, but also now all of Ephesus knows your story. Hey, weren't you the dude where the one guy came and beat your pants off? Like, that's not what you want to get known for. It's time to change careers, maybe move. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and Catch this, and fear fell upon all them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So Jesus gets praise even from people misusing his name. Let's keep going. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. What practices were those? And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Okay, what just happened? We have this crazy story about fake exorcists who are con men who are making money. They try to use Jesus' name in the wrong fashion. They don't believe in him, but they think maybe there's some power there. I'm going to use him to go cast out an actual demon. They all get beat up. They lose their clothes. They run away. But then people hear about it. And in the process of people hearing about it, great fear falls upon people with an understanding of who God is, that he is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he'll do. And all of a sudden, what comes out in their life. Now, listen to who, who we're talking about. We're talking about Christians. We're talking about believers. We're not talking about Jews and Greeks who are non-Christian heard about this and came to faith. That may have happened. It did happen over time. We're primarily talking about people who already believe in Jesus Christ. They're already following Jesus, listening to Paul. They're already in the church in Ephesus. They hear about this, and all of a sudden, it gets really real. Really real. So real that as fear falls upon them, they begin to admit privately and publicly to sin in their life that they've been hiding. In this case, one of the main things is they've been practicing sorcery, magic arts, other types of things. They publicly admit it. They come out into the center square. They take all of their books, these magic books, they pile them up and they burn them on display for all to see what happened. Because what happens right after this is a massive spread of the gospel. I mean, it's already spreading like crazy, but when this happens, the church really takes off. We see revival all over the place. We see uh, believers begin coming to faith. We see this massive growth in the church in Ephesus. What happened? Three things happened in this story, and I don't want you to miss it. Number one, there is a fear and reverence for God that is developed because of what they hear about here. As God moves in power, as they begin to see what happens in the spiritual world that is so different than what's happening in the physical world, as they begin this realization of how serious the issue is, of what the spiritual battle looks like, of who God is, fear and reverence for God fall upon them. Second thing that happens, as fear and reverence fall upon them, they realize they can no longer tolerate or hide sin that they've been tolerating, sin in the life of a believer that they've been hiding from one another and not repenting of. And the third thing they do, third thing they do is they repent. They repent, they repent to God and they repent publicly to one another. Now, here's what I want to submit to you when 
in Revelation 2, we see all the good things about the church, but the Bible says, but you need to repent because you've lost your love. What are they really saying? Well, they're saying, listen, at the heart of this gospel is a relationship between you and God. It is a fear and reverence for God. It is a love for God. It is a desire for a relationship, but it is you beginning to understand not just what was done for you, but who you're dealing with. There's a fear and reverence in following God that is stirring up your affection for God because it, it doesn't allow you to tolerate sin. So how do you grow in that love for Jesus Christ? How do we continue to stay in this place that, that the Bible says Ephesus needs to get back to? And you repent and get back to. Well, I, I, I think it, it's two different things depending on where you're at in your faith with Christ. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, man, I would love to talk to you at some point. All of us, whether it's in chat, whether it's uh, online, whether it's on campus, in a group, we would love to chat with you. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is and you have an under, you, you want to know what the difference is between religion and relationship, we want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the gospel. But for the believer, listen, if you're a mature believer in Christ, then, then more than likely the things that you're dealing with that are robbing your affections and your love and your reverence for Jesus Christ, they're not outright sin. Now, if they are, if, if you're maybe... Maybe you're not a mature believer in Christ. Maybe there are just temptations. You know they're sin. You continue to do them. You're struggling with them. Listen, I, let me just tell you this. If you are in that place today where you know it's sin, you just keep doing it. Uh, I, I need you to look back. I would love to talk to you about this, but the Bible describes sin as an apex predator. Every time the Bible talks about sin, it talks about sin lurking at your door wanting to devour you. Sin is not something you, to you, you, you toy around with, that you play with, that you, you think is fun. Uh, sin, sin is like having a lion as a pet. It may look cute when it's young, but when it's full grown, it's going to eat you. You don't, you don't keep the lion on a leash or in your house, and then, then you're scratching your head wondering like, why the dog disappeared and where it went. It must have run away, and the lion's burping. Like You have this realization that it is dangerous. And, and, and if you are struggling with just open temptation in your life, then I would just tell you, listen, you cannot tolerate sin and love Jesus. You can't do it. If you really love Jesus, if you want this relationship with Jesus, you have to have an understanding that sin is as dangerous as the Bible says it is. You've got to take it out in the backyard. You've got to dig a grave for it. You've got to pull it a bullet in its head and bury it. There's a toying with it. But for the believer in Christ, for the mature believer in Christ, for the person that is, that is struggling with this over time, my temptation, your temptation to not be a religious person is this. This, this is a daily thing for me. When I lose the intimacy of a relationship with Jesus Christ, I default to religion. I default to performance-based religion. And to fight that, I'm constantly looking at what does it look like for me to stir up my affection for Jesus Christ? What does it look like to stir up my passion for Jesus Christ? So that it is not merely a sequential set of checkboxes that I'm doing, but it is a dynamic, spirit-filled relationship that I am pursuing with Jesus every single day. What does that look like? Because for the believer, listen to me, for the mature believer, the things that are robbing you of your passion, your affection for Jesus Christ, generally are not negative things. They're morally neutral things. They're not bad, they're not good, they're just things, but you have allowed them to creep into your life, and as they've crept in, you've pushed out the passion, the dynamic relationship for Jesus. As Bono would say, religion is what's left when the Holy Spirit leaves the building. In Revelation 2, we see a church has great religion, but they have no dynamic, passionate relationship. So what does it look like for you and I to stir up our affection, our passion for Jesus? It is a discipline. It's a thing we work at. It's a thing we understand. It's a thing that for you and I, listen to me, it's probably unique. It has some unique uh, differences from believer to believer, and you need to know what they are. As I uh, pursue my wife, I, I, I'm not pursuing my wife anymore in hopes that she'll marry me. I'm already married. Believer, do you understand this? You're not pursuing God anymore in hopes that he'll save you. He's already saved you, but I still pursue my wife. I still have things that I'm disciplined on that I do that are unique to our relationship because I know what it's going to take to continue to stir up an intimate, passionate relationship with my wife. And you need to know what that looks like in your relationship with God and then practice that with great discipline in order to keep that passion stoked. So let me just 
for a few minutes tell you what mine are and then encourage you to go discover what yours are. What about me? For me, active things that help me stir up my passion for Jesus Christ every single day. Number one, I love, I love other people's God stories. What does that mean? I love to hear about how God has moved on the behalf of someone else. I love when someone comes to me and they're like, man, I just want to tell you what God's been doing in my life lately. Like I'm going to have my affection and passion and reverence for Jesus elevated as you begin to, in testimony, tell me what God's done in your life. I know it. I know it's why the community of Christ is so important for me is that in isolation, when I don't get to hear that, it, I begin to slow down in my pursuit of Christ. Number two, for me, uh, it's not just great worship. It's not just great praise music. It, it's not just praising God, although th- those are all effective for me. But every once in a while, man, I'm going to crank up some of my favorite worship songs in my truck usually while I'm driving. And I'm going to start singing the top of my lungs where no one else can hear. And I'm probably going to get to the point where I'm just ugly crying and I'm trying to see the lane markers. So I have to slow down and, and get on the side of the road and like wait until the sobbing's done. But there is something about some of the songs that just remind me of where I was at before Christ pulled me out of the muck and cleaned me up. And third for me uh, is recounting God's faithfulness in my life. I keep prayer journals. I like to look back at what God's done. I like to look back in the rear view mirror and real, realize how amazing God has been in my life, answering prayers, transforming me, not tolerating my sin. Those are things that change me. They, they stir up my affection. They stoke the flames of a passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ. And I know that I must allow time and be disciplined in my life around those things if I want to give myself an opportunity to have those flames stoked. If not, I'll be cold. When I'm cold, I become legalistic. When I'm legalistic, God is far from me and my life. And only by his grace does he keep me from going all the way off the rails and have to pull me back in. Now, this is what I want to submit to you is that without the community of Christ and your own personal disciplines, knowingly finding ways to passionately stir up your affection for Jesus Christ, what will occur in your life is a default toward performance-based behavior. We see that in the Pharisees and Sadducees in the religious elite of that time where uh, I will just create a moral framework and I'll try to be really moral. If I'm really moral and I have really good doctrine, I'll be okay. But Revelation 2 says, no, that's not the case, believer. You may have good morals, you may have good doctrine, but if you've lost the love, if you've lost the pursuit of me, if you lost the relationship, then all of it is worth nothing. And and I struggle with this, particularly in American church, because we've created such a moralistic behavior that oftentimes we have churches that are full of people that understand theology and they understand doctrine and they understand morals. I could tell you all about what type of movie you you should be allowed to see and what you shouldn't be allowed to see. And if it's rated R or it's rated PG-13 or what type of music's okay, what type of music's not okay. They give you all of the rules from their life that you should apply to your life. But they easily miss this passionate pursuit. And it hurts people. It hurts me. It hurts one another. That moralistic behavior is what pushes people from Christ, not invites them in. And I struggle with that. I struggle to love people that are merely religious. It, it hurts. It's hard. I need help and mercy and grace to do it. But Jesus loved even the moralistic people. I want to read you a quick story and we'll finish. I want, to, I want to show you how much Jesus, even though it made him angry, even though it made him sick and nauseous, how much he loved religious people. In Luke 15, he tells this amazing story called the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, if you've never heard, I think we've all heard it. The prodigal son, is there's two sons, and there's basically a good son and a bad son. And the bad son uh, asks for half his inheritance. He takes it. He runs to faraway land. He squanders it all. Then there's a famine, and he's out of money, and he's done a bunch of really dumb, sinful stuff with it. And so he finds himself eating a pig slop, and he realizes, like, even my dad's servants and slaves live better than I live right now. And so he... He knows, he, he knows he's wrong. He goes back and he wants to just go beg his dad for a position as a servant. His dad sees him from far away off and he runs to him and he hugs him and he puts a robe on him. He calls for a huge feast and he can't, I, my son is back and he just, he accepts him. And we, we look at the prodigal son because it's called the prodigal son. And we think this, this story is all about this son who went away and, and this, ma- this father who welcomes him back in. But that's actually not what the story is about. And I want to read you this part right here. This starts in Luke 25 after the son has come home and the feast has been called and the robe and the ring have been put on the prodigal son. Then in verse 25, you see this. Now the older son 
the good son who didn't run away and do all this stuff. The older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. When Jesus is telling this story, he's not speaking to Zacchaeus. He's not speaking to the woman of ill repute or the woman at the well. He's not speaking to the prodigal son. He's telling this story to Pharisees and Sadducees. He's telling this story to the religious elite. He's telling this story to the moralistic, self-righteous people who were very religious at that time. He's not telling the story about the prodigal son. He's telling the story about the older son. And he's saying, listen to me, not only did I come to save that which was lost, but I came to show you that this moralistic, legalistic behavior misses the entire point of relationship with the Father. And he's calling the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's calling you and I who will struggle with self-righteous, moralistic, legalistic behavior back into relationship with him to not miss the joy that is, the contentment that is relationship with the Father, not simply legalistic behavior. He's speaking to the old, older son, and I, I hear that, and it's so difficult because I, I know that in a moment's notice, as I lose the passion for Christ, that I will become legalistic and moralistic again. And so I just want to close with this. In your life, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've done your best to not tolerate the open sin in your life, where in your life have you become more moralistic or legalistic than in love with Jesus? Because in love with Jesus is real contentment, is real satisfaction, it is real peace. And you'll look at the prodigal son, the other sons, the people around you with such grace, knowing that Jesus came for them. But as you become moralistic and self-righteous, you'll look at them with nothing but bias and judgment in your eyes and your heart. And so I would tell you the same three things that the Bible is telling the church in Ephesus. Number one, where have you lost fear and reverence for the Father? Where are you tolerating secret hidden sin that's not being repented of and drug out into the public square and set on fire like those books? Which is why community, biblically based, Christ-centered community is so important. Because it calls you on the stuff you want to hide in the closet. And where are you failing to repent? Repentance should be a daily, weekly, regular occurrence in the life of the believer where I admit wrong both vertically to God as I've sinned against him and to others as there's been implication on them. And I deal with the fact that I'm wrong, but that God loves me anyways. Repentance has become almost an unspoken word in the church. Where have I failed to repent so that I can, so that I can look to the things that will stir up my affections, and my passion for Jesus Christ. I'd like you to, if you have an opportunity here in community and group to now, we're going to break and you can uh, move in with your group or with your online group and discuss that. Where in your life do you need to make changes, both on the repentance side of sin that you're hiding or on the pursuit side, because they're morally neutral things that have encroached into the time and the space and the energy and the mental space that it takes you to go pursue Jesus. And today, what are the things you need to change in your life to more, to just stir up and stoke the affection for Jesus Christ so that this is more relationship and less religion? Amen.